Uh, whenever I show these slides and do these programs, people uh, like to know how I got interested in it. And uh, I usually get these questions after the show. So what I thought I'd do is kind of give a little background about me and, and how I come to be interested in this uh, to begin with. Um, back in the 60s, I was a, a, a Harley rider back when that really wasn't uh, the thing that everybody was doing. And uh, I took a motorcycle trip from Florida uh, to California across the United States. And I saw this country for the first time. And I liked it very much and decided this is where I wanted to live. And it took me a few years to get out here. But, but I wanted to learn about the Central Coast in a place I lived in. And, and eventually, a friend recommended uh, the book that you were passing around this evening, The, the Face of the Clam. And, uh, and I read the book. And it's about you know, the Dunites who lived in the dunes of Oceano and, and back in here. And I was struck by uh, one thing. When you first opened the book, it said uh, that there never were any Dunites and any resemblance to any living or dead is purely coincidental. But just about three inches down on the same page, it says uh, the author wants to thank that great Dunite, Edward C. St. Clair, for the use of his poem in the book. So you can see right there was a paradox. And I kind of puzzled around about that. And uh, when I read the book, and it was pretty interesting. It's kind of a um, comical overview of some of the people. And it was, they portrayed them as being kind of funny, uh, odd types. And some of them were. And uh, sometime after that, I was hiking in the dunes. And I, early in the morning, there was no wind blowing. And I saw a pillar of smoke coming up out of one of the dune thickets. And so that made me curious. And so I went all the way around the thicket and found, finally found a path going back in that was pretty well worn. However, the willow trees were growing over the path and had not been pruned back. So you had to kind of lift up these limbs to follow the path back in there, which looked to me like somebody had did that on purpose to kind of disguise the entryway. It's almost like they were spring-loaded gates. And so you'd lift up these <laughs> branches and walk back in. And so I proceeded back into the thicket, and it opened up into a, a clearing. And in the clearing was two buildings out of wood and a garden. And I could see somebody had laundry. And I could just, by looking around, see that somebody had been living there a very long time. Uh, there was a man standing there uh, working with his back turned to me. And so I, I stood there and just watched for a little while. And pretty soon he sensed my presence and, and, and turned around and looked at me. And I was dying to talk to this guy. And he turned around away from me, so I, I sensed that he did not want to be bothered. And I respected that and left. And it was about three months after that that I read in the paper where that fellow had died. And there was an article in the Santa Maria Times. And his name was Bert Skeving. And he was the last of the Dunites and had lived there for 34 years. So this kind of set my brain on fire. I started thinking about the face of the clam. Here's the last of the Dunites. And the article mentioned that there had been others. So that kind of set me on a quest to find out more and more about the people who lived in the dunes and ultimately brought me here where we are tonight. And I'm kind of trying to share more of this with you. Oftentimes, people just take snapshots, not realizing that's going to be the only surviving record of, of that person. So some of these are, are not what you'd call professional pictures, but. Uh, this picture here is, is from Oceano looking south in the dunes. Kind of shows part of the habitat. This is, a, this is the high dunes um, in the evening, which is my favorite time when the sunlight hits the dunes at an angle and lights up all those little ridges and the ripples on the dunes. People always wonder, you know, what those people did for water. Did they carry, you know, sparklets water jugs from town to, you know, get by or what? There's a lot of fresh water in the dunes. There's nine to 11 freshwater lakes, depending upon whether it's been a wet season or a dry season. This one is Pipeline Lake. It's the one that's the northest most uh, freshwater lake in the dunes. Uh, this is about a half a mile south of Oceano city limits. I took this picture up on the Napomo Mesa. You can see it from there. Food. This is wild strawberries. These look like they're green, uh, but they're not. They're very, very tasty. Some of the original inhabitants of the dunes, of course, were the Chumash. They were in this area for a very, very long time. I see 
Uh, recently down off the Channel Islands they found what they call Arlington Springs women, 13,000 years old, and they're having to rewrite a lot of things they previously believed about the earlier inhabitants of the American continent. Uh, this is one of the Chumash middens that's in the dunes. This is very big, it covers about a half a square block, and there's artifacts and chippings and of course a great deal of shells that you can see here. Uh, that was one of the staples for the people who lived here on the central coast. This is Clam Digger Belly. He was one of the locals that commercially harvested clams. There was a time period when you could get a license and commercially harvest them and sell them. And that's what he did. You heard me talk about Edward C. St. Clair a little bit earlier. This is the fellow here that's in the front page of the face of the clam. Uh, he was a Spanish-American War veteran. Came into the dunes sometime after the Spanish-American War and lived there until the time of his death, which was around 1923 interesting thing is his cabin that you see here. He's kind of utilizing whatever's at hand in his smokestack. He has a little downdraft diverter made on the top out of an old tomato can. Or he wrote a, a book called uh, Wind Woven Rhymes that he published, a small book of verse. I've always been interested in some of the different ways they, they built the places that they lived in. This is down by Point Sal. I don't know who this fellow is, but it's kind of interesting because it's the only two-story dune structure that I know of. This is Hugo Selig. Uh, went into the dunes right after the First World War. He was disenchanted with the state of humanity at that time. Uh, lived there in total solitude for many years. He wrote a book of verse that's interesting. It's The Wheel of Fire. It was published in 1936 by the uh, Oceano Roundtable Press. This is the Lagrandi Pavilion, and there were three pavilions on the central coast. Uh, this was the uh, largest and the most ornate. Two stories on the bottom was to be um, boutiques and gift shops, uh, land sales office, uh, and, and all that sort of thing because they had planned a city to be erected in the dunes called Lagrandi. And this was going to be the center of the city, and this was about two miles south of Rio Grande Creek, which is the southern limits of Oceano city limit. And you can see they're dragging the lumber with horses. This is back in the horse and buggy days. They had a pump station uh, with electric generator to make lights for this uh, pavilion. The top story was a dance floor and had a grand piano. And this was a, quite a grand undertaking that ultimately failed. This is opening day, 4th of July. 1905. And as you can see, it's all horse and buggy. They had lights strung all, all across the top. I guess when it was lit at night, it was pretty impressive with the lighting in the front of this thing. They tore it down for scrap. It fell into dis disuse. And uh, the interesting little side story there, I guess I'll tell. They, they built an auto court out of the lumber. This was all first class lumber in Oceano. And I came along years later as a training officer for the fire department on a burn, a training exercise where we were going to burn this whole thing to the ground. And I stood there with the flares in my hand with the engines running and the guys all ready to go with their hose lines and stuff. And I was, it was explained to me right then that this was made from lumber from this pavilion. Well, instantly my mind, I'm thinking I'd like to take some of the better pieces of wood and I don't know, build a little liquor cabinet or a coffee table or something from this wood because it's historic wood, if you will. It, it just wasn't happening. They were ready and all these people and I put a torch to it and watched the whole thing go up in smoke. So, one of those things. This is the set of the um, Ten Commandments. Interesting thing in the face of the clam where they rounded up some of the regulars uh, in the dunes to use as extras in the movies because, uh, you know, they had a, a cast of thousands and that uh, that those people would go to the movies to see themselves in the silent movies. Of course, it's a cast of thousands, and here's the, uh, you know, Exodus from Egypt, and all these. The guy said, "That's me. Can you see me?" And of course, to see your faces, you know. <laughs> but uh, so some of them did get part-time work. And this is uh, from the top of the mound where the set is today. This is a fellow named Slim. Everybody had nicknames. I talked to a county recorder one time in San Luis Obispo told me, he said, I was given a job to go out on the dunes and assess these people and find out where they lived and get an address and so we can, you know, do a little taxation thing there. And, 
and his boss sent him out there, and everybody had Slim and Blackie and, uh, and all these nicknames, and, and he would approach him and say, what's your name, Slim? Uh, what's your full name, Slim? Uh, well, what's your address? Uh, this is it, I have no address. And, and, and everybody he talked to was that way, and finally at the end of the day, he went back and explained to his boss, the county recorder, the situation, he says, <laughs> okay, <laughs> leave those people alone, there's no way we're gonna assess this. This fellow was kind of renowned for being a, a real bad alcoholic, and during the uh, prohibition days, he would take, he would drink women's perfume by straining it through loaves of bread, and they all had stories about Slim and the things he would do. He'd drink Sterno and, and get horribly ill, and uh, finally, finally died from it. This is Slim's cabin, and uh, the lighting's not too good, but the top of the roof is all clamshells. What he would do is he would go to the beach and find these pieces of tar to float in and stick to your shoes sometimes when you're down there in the summertime. He collected that stuff and he put it on the roof and, and he put the, cob the, the clamshells on top. They were like cobblestones. So it's kind of a unique uh, little artsy roof style that he'd come up with. And this is Elwood Decker. He uh, came into the dunes in 1931. That's when this picture was taken. He was a young man. Uh, he became eventually known as the Patriarch of the Dunites. Some of you might have remember reading about him here back in 92. He was struck by a freight train. And that's how he ended his days, 88 years old. This is him in his cabin. Later years he became a, a vegetarian. And uh, I came up with this picture which he had never seen. And he was appalled at all the canned food and stuff on his shelves, you know. He says, my God, he says, I used to eat that stuff. <laughs> This is one of his paintings. Uh, he was an artist. He always had interesting titles on the back of his paintings. This, this one here is uh, Time, Unveiling a Shower of Dreams Upon the World of the Senses. And this is another one. He, he loved color and when he came out with the new bright acrylic paints, well then he did things like this. And this is a charcoal sketch he did that I am really fond of has that deep, brooding, mysterious feeling you get just in the very late evening when the wind quits and the shadows come out, you know, it's a nice picture. Uh, this is one he did, just kind of a, a hurried, uh, off the top of his head thing, it's called Midnight at Oso Flaco. And this is the one that I chose for the cover of my own book, I like it a lot. That's Elwood on the left, and the fellow named Carl Beckstead on the right, a do night. And the lady in the middle is a, a lady who came into the dunes to find her son, who was a sculptor, who lived in the dunes, was trying to study dune uh, forms as inspiration for his abstract sculpture. And she found Elwood, and they fell in love and got married and left the dunes in 1946. And this is right before they were leaving on the beach. And this is him in later years. I like this picture. He sent it to me, and, and on the back side he wrote, this is only an illusion, but what's the matter with nothing? It la outlasts everything solid and is the foundation of heaven. That's the kind of guy he was. 